Today's message, uh, as you see in the title, Life Takes Identity. Uh, depending uh, on your identity, your life is determined by that. So through this message, I want us to confirm what is, what is our identity like? You know, what's our real identity? And then what kind of a life are we called uh, to live? <clears throat> in the introduction, uh, the phrase man of God is used in the Bible a lot and uh, is used for people like Moses uh, a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, this phrase uh, means the following things. First of all, it means a person who belongs to God, somebody that belongs to God, then that is a man of God. Romans 14, 8 says, for if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to the Lord. So that is a man of God, M-O-G, a man of God. And then secondly, it means a person that does the work of God. Of course, you know, obviously. You can't be a man of God and you're doing other work that is not the work of God. A man of God is someone that is doing the work of God. And I know, uh, especially from the English-speaking countries, we, we use this phrase, man of God, uh, when you're talking about pastors. So they don't even say pastor so and so, they say, Hey, M-O-G, you know, a lot of my Kenyan friends normally call me M-O-G, man of God. But this man of God is not only for pastors and maybe elders. This man of God is for anyone who belongs to God. Amen. Amen. So if you belong to God, you are a man of God. You are a woman of God. Amen. If you're doing the work of God, and most importantly, if you're not blocking the work of God, you are a man of God. The book of John 6, we see when the Pharisees, they were talking with Jesus and they asked him, what is the work of God? And Jesus said, the work of God is to believe in him whom he sent. So that is the work of God. So if you believe in Jesus, you have done the work of God. Amen? Amen. If you don't believe in Jesus, no matter how you clean the church, no matter how you, you, you know, I don't know, whatever you do in the church, if you don't believe in Jesus, if you've not accepted Christ in your heart, you're not doing the work of God. So the work of God is basically believing in Jesus and receiving him as your Christ. Amen. And then... A person that reveals the power of God. Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God. So if you're revealing the gospel in your field, in your family, in your life, you're a man of God. And then finally there, a person that gives glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 uh, says, Whether you, uh, whatever you eat and whatever you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So that's a man of God. So Paul spoke to Timothy about identity very strongly. If you look in all the episodes of Paul to Timothy, he speaks about the calling as an apostle. And he strongly tells Timothy about his identity as a pastor. Uh, most importantly, as a child of God, as a disciple of Christ. Because he wanted him to have a correct spiritual posture. And by doing that, to live a walk of faith uh, that is full of life and action. Uh, Paul really emphasized, even today in the message, he says, fan the flame. So he really emphasized about a walk of faith that is full of action. And that action is not just doing so many things, but it's the action of holding to the word, praying according to the word, receiving answers according to the word. And you have testimonies and answers every time. That is the walk of faith that Paul emphasizes the most here in these uh, episodes. That's why even the Bible says, uh, don't be a lukewarmer. Be either hot or cold. And that's what the Bible really emphasizes. You know, even going to church for 30 years, 40 years, there are people who have not even once experienced the word of God being fulfilled in their lives. As the Bible says, the word is living and active. That means this word of God is working even right now. If you believe in its promises, you're going to see those answers happening in your life. For me, by nature, I think I'm not really somebody who could believe in uh, Buddhism or, you know, those religions, oh, just like going like that. And it's kind of dark inside, you know, in their halls and all that. Um, there's one person that I know, he says, uh, not, don't even paint the church with like plain colors like this. Paint it with like rainbow colors, you know, and make it, you know, really, really look fun and, and awesome. Oh, because faith life is something to really enjoy. If you say, I'm saved, I'm a child of God, some people think that is a burden that they have to bear. It's something that you really have to enjoy and be happy every day because of that, what Christ has given to us. What does that really mean? 
Don't be deceived by introductory things. Hold on to the main things. Hold on to the main things, the gospel of Christ that he's given us. So the first point is identity and spiritual problems. The difference between believers and unbelievers is only one thing. The difference between believers and unbelievers is not about their moral standards, but it's about their identity and their spiritual position, their spiritual address. Where are you right now? That's a very big difference. Now, I'm going to tell you about three things that can clearly give you a very big difference between a believer and an unbeliever. Number one is that the moment you receive Jesus as the Christ in your life, your identity was completely changed. In other words, you have crossed over from being called a, a, a child of the devil and now you are a child of God. Amen. That's something that happens the moment you receive Jesus Christ in your life. Not until you're baptized, not until you're speaking in tongues, not until you become a choir master. The moment you say, Jesus, come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Let's, let's repeat together. Jesus, Jesus. come, into my, heart come into my heart as my Lord. And savior. and savior. The moment you just do that, you cross over from death into life. And it's all finished. And then the second thing, the direction of your life also has been changed. In the beginning, you are heading towards destruction and hell. But the moment you receive Christ in your life, you are changed from that direction into the direction of God's work, world evangelization, and heaven in the future. But if you live your life here on earth just like before, running towards your direction, running towards your physical things, your material things, your own motivation, then that's when you have problems in your life. That's when faith life becomes difficult. That's when there is no action, there's no works of God, there's no working of the Holy Spirit. Because God changed your direction, but you haven't changed your direction. And then the third thing here is, you are now in Christ. When you receive Jesus in your heart, you are now in Christ. Of course, Christ is in you, but you're also in Christ. Look up here. So we have this little, I don't know what to call it, like little cup, and you put it into a very big trough, and you fill this trough with water now. And this water is also inside the trough, as in, inside this little uh, small bottle there. And so what, I, uh, what are you saying here? There is, the little bottle is in the trough, but also this trough, the water that is in the trough is also inside that little bottle. So the moment you receive Jesus, yes, Jesus comes into your heart as your Lord and, your, and, and the Savior and the Master of your life, but also... You are in Christ. Amen. So it's not just Jesus coming into my life and then that's it. But you're also in Christ. That's something that really happens there. And you have started living the main life. So now it means that the introductory things, the things that this world is fighting to have them, those things you're able to discard them. And you're able to just focus on the spiritual things the things that God has already prepared for you from long ages in the past. Amen. Your identity will give you the viewpoint of things, especially about problems, depending on who you are. Okay, if something happens, the police will come and look at that in a different way. The detectives will come and look at that in a different way. A pastor also looks at that you know, same incident with a different perspective. Depending on who you are, you can look at the same thing with different perspective. That's why somebody said that depending on who you support, you can, tell, you can say that Napoleon defeated all the kings of the world but da bowed down to, uh, to the Pope. Some people say like that. But the French people don't look at it like that. They have their own viewpoint of, this, of the same incident that happened in history. Uh, two weeks ago, um, there was the Samuel Joel, uh, um, March 1st, and there's a movement I don't really know a lot about Samuel Joel, actually, because the church said, let's go. I just went there. Uh, I looked a little bit on the internet, and it's about some movement about some freedom or something like that. I might be 20% right so far. And up in that place, in the city hall, there were so many people, about 5,000, 6,000 people standing there. 
and politicians are coming and saying that our problem is because of North Korea. It's because of the, you know, you know, they're making these nuclear weapons. Stop it! And you know, somebody comes and you know, everybody is saying things, telling that the problem of Korea is because of this. It's because of Kim Jong-un. It's because of Kim Il-sung. It's because of blah, blah, blah. It's because of our law. It's because of the terrorism law, blah, blah. Any, a lot of people came and said different things. But again, in the middle of it, Pastor John came there too and stood there. And then he said, uh, all the people that were standing before me, uh, they've all said their words and they're all right. They're politicians, they're great people. But I'm a pastor, so I'm going to tell you about this same problem in a spiritual perspective. And then he proclaimed the gospel, Jesus is the Christ, in front of everybody there. Uh, so depending on who you are, your viewpoint of problems, your viewpoint of incidents is all different. Last week, there was one Kenyan in Kwangju that killed a Korean man. I, I don't know if uh, other guys from Kenya know about that. And it's a big news. It's on TV. It's everywhere. I, I went somebody, somewhere and they said I'm from Kenya. And somebody started like, looking at me in a sus sus suspicious way. And I'm like, you know, I don't kill. I give life. You know, I was <laughs> just thinking about that in, you know, to myself. But it's a really big issue. So when I, when I saw that news on Kakao Talk, I, I thought, oh, maybe it's get, just going to get caught by the police. It's going to go to prison. That's what I thought. But they kept sending us messages in the Kakao Talk. I'm sure Brother Dan and all other Kenyans have probably you know, been receiving these messages. Uh, for one whole week, he's, he's not talking to anyone. I, oh, that is strange. And then I just you know, let, let it go like that. And then they kept sending us more messages that now he's shouting and, and uh, he's in the prison. And just with bare hands, he's taking off the prison bars. Somebody asked me, oh, how big is he? I said, how big can you be to like, remove prison bars with your hands? No matter, no matter how big you are, you cannot just pull those prison bars with your hands. Simply put, he's demon possessed. And we saw a video that he's shouting and crying loud like that. So when I saw that video, I just said, oh, this really hurts because he's also a Kenyan. And not really because he's a Kenyan, but because of the you know, whole incident itself. Uh, and I said, oh, I wish I could meet this guy and talk to him. And people took it so seriously. And uh, anyway, it happened to be tomorrow we're going to go there. And we're going to see this man and talk to him. So pray about that tomorrow. Um, you know, somebody who is breaking even prison bars. I don't know how, uh, what, what, what's going to happen to me. But it's something that I think I really have to go, you know, spiritually when I look at that. But when I go there, what, 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 what am I going to tell him, actually? You know, I thought about that to myself when I'm praying. Am I going to be like a detective? Tell us what happened. Why did you kill this man? That's why they're being beat. Some people went there from the embassy yesterday, and they were, they were chased away you know, by him. He said, give me a Bible. They said, I don't have a Bible. And he started shouting and screaming at them. That, you know, they had to go. So shall I go there and say, why did you kill this man? You know, what did he do to you? I'll not go and say that. I'll go and tell him why he killed the person because he doesn't even know why he killed the man. So I'm going there to tell him, uh, this is why you killed that person. It's not even your influence. is not that you're bad, but there's an influence you're receiving right now because of your spiritual ident identity. But don't worry, there's someone who is more greater than him. He already crushed Satan's power. If you receive him in your heart, you're going to be free from this problem. Amen. That's what he needs to hear. Really pray about it tomorrow because right, right now, um, a lot of people are trying to already block that. And that man really needs to hear the gospel and receive Jesus Christ in his life. Amen. Pray about it. So how are you going to apply this in your life? How are you going to apply about identity and spiritual problems? Number one, uh, look at your order of priority. Look at your order of priorities. What is the most important and the most important thing in your life? You consider it as the first priority. Is it your success? Is it you having money? Is it you becoming you know, something that you wanted really to be in your life? Or is it Jesus? Or is it the spiritual, is it the word of God? Look at the, your order of priority. Look at your view of material things and wealth. Simply put, what is your view about money? What is your view about money? What is your view of the meaning of life, including the direction of your life, solution, especially for the young people that are still in college. I really want to tell you about that. If you have a clear direction, if you have the right direction, everything falls into place. Just get the right direction from the Word of God, then everything else falls. Is it, is it true? Yes, it is true. 
Uh, where did I read about that? I did not read it about, about it anywhere. I saw it in my life and the life of many other people. Once your direction falls into the right direction, then everything falls into place. And then, what is your view of answers? You also need to uh, focus on that. And then the second point, the second thing here, is about identity and spiritual battle. The first point was identity and spiritual problems, but now it's about identity and spiritual battle. Uh, before one receives Christ, that time, the Bible says clearly in the book of John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil. That's what the Bible says. But, so the relationship between you and the devil before you receive Jesus is that it's like a father and a son, a family. And children normally hear and listen to, the, to their fathers, right? That's why non-believers, all they're doing right now, they're just doing everything the devil is just instructing them and commanding them to do. To an extent, if they don't do it, then they have problems coming in their lives. But the moment you receive Jesus Christ in your life, as I said earlier, you become a child of God, but now you become someone that has authority to defeat Satan. And the Bible says you become an, uh, the devil becomes your enemy. The book of 1 Peter says, your enemy, the devil. Not your father anymore, your enemy now. But most importantly is that you have authority to defeat him. That's why he's trying to deceive you. And man cannot change his identity by himself or even by the help of other people. In other words, spiritual identity is like a spiritual DNA. You cannot change it by yourself. But when you receive salvation, it is completely changed. Knowing about God or knowing about this, uh, God already prepared a way for your spiritual DNA to change. That's why the Bible says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is the spiritual battle we need to fight even today. When you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you receive salvation. You receive this identity of now fighting against Satan. And in spiritual battle, there is no truce. There is no ceasefire. Even if you take break from spiritual battle, the devil does not take any break. He keeps fighting against you. That's why I want to really emphasize about this point that when you say Jesus is the Christ, this is not something I can just write on the board and say, you know what, uh, Jesus is the Christ. I cannot just do like, I cannot just teach you like that. Or in other words, it's not something that you can just receive and have it in your life just by learning. It has to go through training. Now we also have soldiers here and I've not been anywhere near where they train, but there's a lot of soldiers or ex-soldiers uh, here. You know, I think if you, if you teach somebody how to shoot a gun, I think it's just by one time, you just show him like that, this is how you do it, you shoot it. Just, just one go, they can know how to shoot a gun, right? But why do they do that continuously every year, every month? They go do the same things, crawl down, jump, jump again, take the bag, run, the same things, they keep doing that over and over again. Right now, about 17,000 soldiers in Korea are, are, are training again. They do this every year, and they make North Koreans really, really prane <laughs> for some reason. Why, why do they do that? Every, is that that they don't know about shooting a gun? Don't you think they don't know how to r jump on a parachute? They know that. They've done it every year. But why are they doing it again and again and again? To make it their nature. So Jesus is a Christ. Hold on to the word and pray. Hold on to the word and do evangelism. Just by listening to one lecture one day, you can know everything about it. But why do we repeat it over and over again, over your, over your ears again and again and, again and again and again all the time? It's because if it's not your nature, you will not win in the spiritual battle. Look at the man I'm going to meet tomorrow. I'm sure he's a very kind person. I'm sure he has no problem. But right now this has come to him, spiritual problem. If he had the answer, he could you know, just overcome already, but he did not have the answer of the spiritual problem. That's why, even without him knowing, he drags a 38-year-old man into the bathroom in the basement and kills him there, put chopsticks in his mouth and spoon in his mouth. Completely the works of Satan, the spiritual problem. 
That is why we repeat it over and over again. And to tell you about only Christ, only Jesus. Jesus is a Christ. Hold on to the word. Hold on to the pulpit message. When you hear those things from your, uh, from, uh, from your ring leaders, don't, don't think like they're bothering you. Don't think that they're looking on you down and they're saying repeated, repeated things all over, all over again. It's because it has to be your nature. Otherwise, the soldiers will be like, I'm not going to training this year. Can they really do that? I'm not sure if they can do that. And if they go to training, will they be ex expecting something new? No. Just shoot, run, jump, swim, take cover, and just, OK, go back home. Come back tomorrow again. The same, same thing again and again. I wish we had worship every day. Amen? <laughs> before going to your work, before going to your school, you come here, we worship, we do the same thing, and then you go to school. If we, if we had, a, Muslims are doing that. The New Age is doing that. It's only that we come to church only once a week, and even that, a lot of people think, is bothering too. Why are they doing that? They do that, and they make them being demon-possessed. That's why they cannot hear the gospel. We have started the 21, uh, you know, answers with a few people already. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and today. And then tomorrow, tomorrow is now the second week. Second week to some people, third week for other people as well. But why are we doing, if you look at the 21 things throughout this week, it was just the same thing. Mount Calvary, Jesus finished everything. This is your heavenly mandate. That's the work of God. Just think about Mount Calvary, Jesus finishing everything on the cross. This is rightful for you to enjoy. Enjoy this with one heart. Enter only into this. 24 hours a day, just enjoy Christ. Imprint it with Christ. Why are we saying those things over and over again? The same thing. It's not that because we don't know any other things. It's because there's no truth in spiritual battle. There's no ceasefire. We have to fight every day. You have to be alert every other day. Amen. And God wants you to continue with the spiritual battle. And one thing you have to know that God is sovereign. God is overall. There's nothing that can overcome him and, and defeat him. Let me give you a conclusion. There were two men uh, sitting together eating. One was a bit older and the other one was less old. They were both old, I guess. But the older man was crying, sitting there, it was like tears coming off uh, his eyes and was crying continuously. So the younger man asked him, sir, why are you crying? And he was like, I'm married to a 25 years old woman. She treats me really, really well. Every morning she brings me breakfast, you know, just on the bed and I eat the breakfast and she, she treats me really, really well and I'm so, uh, I think I'm so blessed to have this 25-year-old woman as my wife. And then the young man was like, uh, okay, but uh, sir, what, I asked you, why are you crying? And then he said, ah, on lunchtime, he brings really good food. And I eat it. And then he spends, she spends the entire afternoon just with me, just watching sports channel on TV. And then in the, even, in, the, in the afternoon, we have like tea break and we have biscuits and we just like, you know, just, you know, we're so you know, happy together with her. And then the guy was like, yeah, but I don't really understand exactly why you're crying. And then he says, oh, and then in the evening, you know what she does? She prepares a kind of light dinner outside in the park, and we eat together. We spend the evening there together just holding hands and drinking wine. And, and then he said, but, but that doesn't really tell me why you're crying, please. So why are you crying? And that time he said, I can't remember where I live. <laughs> <laughs> He wants to go home to that 25 years old woman, but doesn't remember where he lives. That's why he's crying. Ah. You know, when I heard about that story, I realized that in Christ there's everything. Amen? Amen? In Christ there's everything. But we keep forgetting that we're supposed to be in Christ. We're always just out there. You don't remember the way to go back and enjoy the blessings of Christ. Today, just <clears throat> by holding to this word, Remember that God this year wants to make you a pillar in the temple of God. A pillar for salvation of souls and a pillar for construction of the temple. If you just remember that, you can really restore your spiritual address. What so? God also has an absolute goal uh, that he has prepared for you. An absolute goal that you have. Maybe 99% of, of us, if we look carefully of the goals we have, they're not really absolute because they're not God-given. May you realize that absolute goal of God that he has given in your life. And then with that, 
realize your absolute commission. And then you can also do your absolute devotion into what God has called you for. I really bless you in the name of the Lord that this year, by holding to uh, the word of God and always remembering that you are a man of God, you are a disciple of Christ, you belong to Christ, you're supposed to always enjoy being in Christ, always remember that and may you have success and victory in all your spiritual battles. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for calling us as disciples of Christ, as man of God, people who belong to you, Lord, that you may declare your wonderful works of the gospel to our families and to our fields. May we remember always that we belong to Christ, that we are in Christ, that no matter what comes to us, Lord, we'll not be discouraged, we'll not be afraid, we'll not be uh, afraid of anything, but Lord, we shall make a correct confession of faith that I am in Christ and the Christ is Jesus who finished every problem of my past, present, and the future, Lord. We give you glory and praise as we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.